Uh, my name is Jeff. I am Vice President of BNI Vibe in Calgary, and I hold the photography seat in that uh, chapter. Um, and today we're going to be attending a session with Robin Shuckman. Robin is the Executive Director for BNI Oregon, Oregon uh, and Southwest Washington, a role she's held since 2002. Additionally, Robin helped develop the BNI Executive Director Training, where she trains BNI franchisees worldwide. Uh, as a global traveler, she's traveled to, lived, worked, or studied in 38 countries and has completed five marathons and has a goal of running a marathon along the Great Wall of China. When she isn't traveling for work, Robin enjoys reading, wine tasting, skiing, racquetball, yoga, uh, and recently took up kayaking. Um, she enjoys supporting her daughter's interest in baking macarons and watching her son Connor excel in ice hockey. She lives with her husband and children on nine acres of forest land outside of Portland, Oregon, with a view of Mount St. Helens. Robin's passion about helping small businesses thrive using good old fashioned referral marketing. Her key to success is the belief that everything happens for a reason and there's always a positive solution in every challenge. Take it away. Great, thank you. Welcome everybody. Today we're gonna to be focusing on optimizing your team and creating team engagement. And uh, this, what I'm talking about today can really be applied to any business. So if you do see me say executive director, just think of that as the business owner as this applies across the board. And uh, the first disclaimer I have with you when talking about teams is that it is up to you as the business owner to do your research, connect with an employment attorney. Even if you have contractors, you want an employment attorney to ensure that you are properly classified. And I'm pretty sure that is applicable even in Canada. Uh, so when in doubt, ask your employment attorney just to make sure that you are uh, in line with your local laws. So four main things I'm gonna focus on today. Uh, it's definitely high content. So grab a notepad, take some notes. We'll ask questions at the end. Uh, the first topic is how to organize an effective uh, launch and support team. This is related to uh, BNI specifically, but that can be any type of team that's in your business. If you need a sales team or a marketing team. So be sure to apply those routines to drive accountability and recognition with that team. Uh, team building tactics to generate engagement and trust and why and how and when to delegate. So we know that as business owners, you can do anything, but it's important to have a team to help you accomplish some of your goals. Now, uh, on this first topic of how to organize an effective launch and support team, the first step is to have a long term plan. So what's your long term plan for your business? Have you thought about where you want to be five or 10 years from now? Uh, in BNI, is it, you know, how many members and chapters is that? If you have a product or service, how many things you need to sell in your business? Um, when you are expanding a BNI region, what cities and communities will you be operating in? And if it's for a, your own personal business, where do you want to expand? What will your organizational chart look like? That's a big question that you want to ask you. You want to identify where are you now, but you also need to think about where are you going to be five or 10 years from now? And what holes do you have to fill? Now, right now, your name might be in every single spot on that organizational chart, and that's okay to start, but you need to recognize what do we need to be thinking about in terms of adding team members to fill those seats, to do those responsibilities, so you can build your business. And then do you have any position descriptions for each of these roles and or future roles? If it doesn't exist today, Find out, do some research, and build out that position description so you know who you need to be identifying uh, to build out your team. Now, obviously, a quick organizational chart, you're going to be at the top. You're, if it, you're building your BNI region, you're going to identify your launch team and your support team, what areas and what cities, what responsibilities. Do you need a bookkeeper? That should be on your organizational chart as well. Uh, do you need to have a um, a, a sales and marketing team or a, a social media expert. So only you can identify for your particular business what kind of organization you need to build. The next step is to identify your candidates. And in the support and launch capacity, each role has a different skill set and a different mindset. So if you're finding support directors, they're typically the ones who will need to have a long term commitment. They really value that relationship building and uh, building relationships with the members long term and seeing them uh, success or more in a mentoring capacity. Versus if you're building a launch team, you might find people who love to build something and then move on. They're more project management. They love to see a beginning and end. 
short term, what's next? That's the type of uh, mindset that you'll need to look for uh, in finding launch directors. You'll want to ask your current team for recommendations. And so uh, who do they know? Who are they connected with out in the community that they'd love to add to this team because they would really enjoy working with them? Uh, be sure to review any recent leadership team members uh, that are uh, currently in a role and they're doing a fantastic and they're wondering what's next. I, I've been the president. I've been the vice president. I'm ready for that next level. Maybe being an ambassador or a director might be that next opportunity to expand and grow their business. And then, of course, invite them to interview for the role. Uh, after that, you're going to think about onboarding. So how are you going to onboard your new team members? And in this capacity, uh, we recommend that directors go through a nat the national director orientation. We also recommend they shadow a current team member because then they start to learn some of the local practices and how the this local team works together. You want to have a mentoring program just because somebody's been through a training doesn't mean good luck, see ya, right? You want to uh, support them for several weeks and even months in the new position that they are on your team. And then they start to feel more connected versus them trying to figure it out on their own. And engage them in regular communication so they know what's going on at all times. They see where they fit into the team. And that could be a, a newsletter. It could be a weekly check-in call. We're going to cover some of those communication uh, points here in a few minutes. And then make sure that you are creating a team environment at all times when it's related to launch and support. For a launch team, do you have a launch coordinator, a point person for them to go to? Uh, are you providing weekly check-ins with this new team member so they feel support right away? Are there monthly launch webinars that might have education and support? Uh, and then regular communication so they know they're doing a good job, they're being recognized for their hard work. On the support side, same idea. It might not be a coordinator, maybe it's a senior director or an area director. Uh, continue with those weekly check-ins. And then is there a monthly regional team meeting where everybody comes together, shares best practices, shares education? and then ongoing team member recognition as well. So my goal when I became an executive director, which was uh, 19 and a half years ago, I'm almost at 20 years uh, in BNI as an executive director, I had to ask myself, what do I want this to look like in several years? And I had set some goals, one of which was to have a waiting list of directors and ambassadors to join my team. I had a long way to go. I had nobody, I was the only staff or director person in my region, but I knew that if I wanted to pro provide enough value to people on my team, the only way for me to measure that was if people were in line to have one of those positions. So think about for your business, if you have people coming to you saying, can I apply to be on your team, work for you, whatever it might be, you know that you're providing value and uh, there are people who are, again, wanting to, to be working with you. So let's move on to routines and communication to drive accountability and recognition. We do an annual team summit, and for your business, it could just be a, an annual retreat or a one-day planning session. Uh, and at this session, you're going to rec uh, do some recognition, talk about successes, what did we achieve in the last year, make sure that you offer business building education so they know how to better build their business by being on your team. Uh, en engage them in small group projects. Uh, maybe there's something that they really enjoy. Maybe they really love the Passport to Success program and they wanna make sure that all of the chapters are fully engaged in it. Uh, so get them engaged in things that they wanna be a part of because then it elevates their desire to be there, uh, the skills that they have and they know that they're contributing to your success. And then uh, do some team building activities, some fun things that'll just make them feel part of the team and that's where you take the jacket off, get down to the human level, and just get to know people on a personal level. And then of course, in our case here, we'll do some goal setting for our BNI region. It gets them on board with what is the next year going to look like. Now this is on an annual basis. We do a couple of days, uh, but I don't then just say, see you next year, right? We have a monthly regional team meeting where we check in and uh, do some accountability. So first of all, recognition and successes. What did we accomplish in the last month? Uh, some education to better build them up as business owners. So continuing the education, you can see a theme there. We talk about state of the region. So where were we, where are we, where we're going? And then check in on those small group projects that they committed to doing. 
Uh, this is that accountability piece. For example, did you have a chance to meet with that chapter about the Passport to Success program that we committed to at our annual team summit, right? Those types of uh, verbal accountability check-ins help to keep project, projects moving on throughout the year. Then we'll, of course, talk about current events and upcoming events. Like right now, we're in the leadership transition time, so we'll be checking on those types of things. Uh, we also do weekly check-ins. Now, this is more one-to-one. -one. Uh, I might check in with my team, and then my uh, senior team might check in with their area and director consultants and lunch directors. But we're always following up on what do we commit up to last week and how did that go? Uh, how did your chapter check-ins go? How did your ambassador check-ins go? What kind of questions are coming up that I can help support you in your position? Individual support on those small group projects. So you committed to this. Do you have any um, stumbling blocks that I can help you with? Uh, what are the current events? What support is needed and upcoming events? So this is a chance for us to get that one-on-one -on -one connection with our team members so they know that they feel fully supported and they never feel alone. So let's uh, talk a little about some team building tactics to generate engagement and trust. Uh, these happen throughout all of those different communication points I just mentioned, such as getting to know you exercises. It might be a trivia, learn something new about everybody. Uh, we've done music trivia. If people will send me songs, I'll play a song at any event and I'll say, all right, whose song, whose favorite song do you think this is? And it's just a chance to really get to know each other. Team socials, we had a, a virtual wine tasting event a couple months ago, that was fun. Uh, when we get back to in-person, don't typically do alcohol, but it might be a picnic or uh, something of that nature. And then small group activities, we break up the team uh, into smaller groups and they get together and get to know each other. So anytime that you can uh, do any sort of activity that really helps to build the relationships amongst the attendees and the members on your team, it makes it uh, much easier for them to do business with each other uh, because they, they know each other. But the most important thing in all of these things in terms of it, creating engagement and trust is always doing what you say you're going to do. Following up and following through. If you commit to giving them support in an area, you better make sure that you give them support in an area. If you commit to putting together a specific team social, make sure that it happens because that only helps to build your visibility and credibility for your business as well. And then this is an important one, why, how, and when to delegate. So now you have a team, they're on board. The first question is why? Why would we wanna delegate? Now, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And that's one thing that I learned early on in forming my business is that I wanted to do everything and I realized there's no way I'm going to grow because I can't do it by myself. So I asked for help. And when you have the right team members, they will step up and support you in whatever you need, especially if it's going to help them in their business. Now, how do you delegate? Uh, simply reaching out to your team members, sharing the why, uh, and identify experts on your team and engage them in the skills that they're really, really good at. Uh, let's see, for example, I needed help on updating my website. I know what I want to look like, but I have no desire to make it happen. So I looked at my team and I said, who actually enjoys this? And how can I help build their visibility and credibility uh, by having them help me with a certain aspect and specifically in that case, uh, updating the website? And then when do you delegate? look at your current team and if you see an opportunity for them to get some visibility that maybe they don't see in themselves invite them to expand their leadership skills by giving it a try we do a lot of uh, co-training or co-presenting in an effort to exchange or share our credibility with each other and now you've built up some amazing trainers for example or uh, presenters or launch directors, or it could be again somebody doing social media. There's a variety of things that you can help, you can pass on to others because you see skills in them that they might not see in themselves. And now, after you've taken the time to uh, share and expand that knowledge, they thank you for uh, believing in them and for helping to build them up. So, really, it's about giving visibility to another team member that you have confidence in can take it on and helping them to become a leader. 
So shadow, co-train, lead, uh, build up other leaders because a true leader produces more leaders. So that's all I had for you today. And I'd love to open it up just for specific questions on how it applies to you or uh, what you might, what questions you might bring to the table. Nothing. What sort of things do you like? Give me some examples of uh, things like things you've delegated or ways that you delegate responsibility uh, to other members. To other team members, uh, one yeah. would be trainings. So I do love to train, uh, but I can't do every single training. Otherwise, I'd be only doing training all the time. And so I've identified one person in every area to shadow me, for example, I'll take member success as an example, but it could be any training. Uh, and I'd have them come attend with me and uh, give them the trainer facilitator guides, the trainer manuals, meet with them afterwards, and just talk about what are the best practices that you learned, what the questions do you have about what was presented. And then the next time I would have them uh, train half of it and I would be there and I would do the other half. So it makes them feel like, oh my gosh, the whole thing is very overwhelming, but I'll start with half. And then the next time they would do the other half. And half doesn't have to be first half, second half, it can be portioned out, however, whatever works for you. And then the fourth time would be them doing it 100% on their own. And I'd give feedback every time. And by the time they were doing it on their own, uh, they now have much more confidence and um, they now realize that they can take it on. So then I can take that off my plate. And I also know that that particular trainer training, that specific training is going to be top notch because we've taken steps to ensure they have the tools that they need and provided feedback. So it takes those trainings off my schedule, opening up to go launch a chapter or whatever I need to be working on. Samantha, you what are some, your hand up. Yeah. Can, you, can you unmute and ask? Hi, um, great presentation. I found it very valuable. I took lots of notes. Um, I do have a question though. I mean, I know this is about BNI and about our different roles as directors and ambassadors, but in regards to our own business, do you think that all the things you discussed today could also be implemented with contractors that you have? They're not necessarily an employee or anything? Yeah, um, for the most part, a few key things on working with contractors would be language. And with language, um, you want to just avoid words like must and required and have to. Uh, you would simply change the language to I invite you to or plan to because those are not requirements. The thing with contractors is that if you still provide so much value that they want to be working with you, they're going to want to do those things versus feel like they have to do those things. Because if anybody ever feels like they have to do something, they do tend to fall into the employee category. Now, I do not know the specific nuances of Canada, uh, but I do believe they're very similar to the United States. And Oregon specifically has extremely high expectations uh, for being an, uh, an employee. In other words, most people are employees. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah. And the other thing with the independent contractors is you're going to have, you can have contract reviews. With employees, you have performance reviews, right? As an employee, you agreed uh, to accomplish X, Y, and Z. That didn't happen. How can we fix it? A contract is I do the same thing, but it needs to be pre-written in the agreement before you start the work. Great question. So, uh, well, I'd like to just share that uh, in recruiting or attracting is a better word, uh, members to our mm -hmm. new group. Uh, I kind of boil down the seven core values of BNI because one of the pushbacks that you get is, I don't have time to add BNI. And I mentioned it in the last room that it really doesn't add any time to my week because I'm already doing the, the values that BNI, the seven core values. And I kind of boiled it down to two. What you're committing to really is lifelong learning and building positive mm -hmm. relationships. And if you look at the seven, when I look at the seven core values, they all come down to those two things. Lifelong learning, 
building positive relationships. And every one of those core values either contributes to one or both. And if they align with that, then you have a much more meaningful conversation than if you're trying to convert them into thinking they've got to stop what they're doing and start doing it differently. So we give them, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book, The Go-Giver, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so that's the name of our new chapter is BNI Go-Givers. And uh, mm -hmm. every time we talk to a new member, we hand them the book and we say, okay, here it's 122 pages. If this doesn't resonate with you, uh, maybe we're not the group, right? So I like we're, that. we're kind of looking for a launch back in about November, uh, sorry, July 8th is when we figured that we'll have uh, the 25 members that we need, but we're not doing the, I love that analogy of the tortoise and the hare. Uh, mm -hmm. We're definitely not doing the hare. Uh, we don't want to be six months into it, scrambling for people with a pulse to join the group, so. Very good. Neville? Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, so you talked about delegating to, learning how to delegate things and, and choosing who to delegate to. How do you encourage the people that you delegate to to further delegate tasks like so they don't become overloaded or as your region or as their responsibilities grow? Is there a way that they can yeah. just kind of share some of the workload to people with them? That's a, that's a good one. I do have team members that come back to me and say, I really want to accomplish this for you, but I just don't understand how I can make it happen. I will always take the time to brainstorm with them what some solutions might be. And uh, in this case, I just brought on a, a few new area directors and they've come to me and said, I totally understand it's important, but I don't know how to make it happen. And I remind them that they have a team themselves. And they don't have enough ambassadors uh, or director consultants, depending on who it is. Um, then we actually take a side step and start brainstorming who's going to fill that seat because that's the only way for us to get it done efficiently and effectively. Um, so really the work, the, the answer is to sit down with them and brainstorm solutions. And that means you suggesting further delegation. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Rob. Hi Robin. Thanks for uh, this session today. Um, my question is like, I, I'm always challenged with delegating. So that's always been a challenge for me personally, but I'm wondering if you have any tools that you use to track um, when you're delegating, like you went through quite a, a list of initiatives that you have there and, and how do you stay on top and keep that organized and, and, and balance everything? So is it like, a, is there a, is it just a calendar that you use or is there another tool that you're using to keep everything organized? Oh, wow. I could do two hours on time management and it's all about what my calendar <laughs> looks like and what does it mean? <laughs> all right. Um, so, so, yeah. Fair enough. I use my calendar a lot. As a matter of fact, um, I don't really have a lot of to-do lists because what's the one thing everyone needs in order to accomplish anything? And it's kind of a trick question. Time. Any guesses? time. It's time. It's the one constant thing that everyone has to have in order to accomplish anything. And the only way that I measure time is on my calendar. And so, for example, last night, um, my son said, did you call the insurance company? I'm like, oh, I forgot. So the first thing I did is I opened up my calendar and I put a reminder on Friday morning Call the insurance company. Otherwise, it's a piece of paper sitting around here, and if I don't see it, it's not going to get done. So I put it on the calendar as an appointment with myself, and I put it during business hours because they're only open during business hours. Um, so I use my calendar to manage everything. Now, to manage the delegation piece, like who have I given what, I am a spreadsheet queen. I've got Excel documents galore in every folder you can think of. Now I do try and consolidate, so there's not too many. But for example, on I'll stick on this training piece, right? If I need to know who I've delegated training to, I have an Excel document that says uh, it's titled uh, my Oregon team, my training team. And I have all my team members on the left and all the different trainings that we offer across the top. And I put a status uh, confirmed or, or sorry, trained, uh, interested, but not yet trained, whatever status it is. So I know next time I present, I'm going to reach out to everybody who's expressed interest and say, come with me. We're going to be here next week. And I also don't tell someone they have to train because not everybody on my team is going to be a great trainer. But if I identify that they're a good trainer and or they've expressed interest, 
then I'm going to mark it down and keep track of it so I can make sure that I'm constantly having them shadow me so they can build their skills and I can start passing off those things. Now, some of you might be thinking, why don't you just tell them to do it and say, here's the tools, good luck. That's not my style. My style. I know that every person on my team who's training one of those trainings is going to be top notch, saying exactly what they need to say and they know how to respond. And I have confidence in that because I've taken the time to identify them and train and shadow with them and then basically certify them myself. And that's just for training, so that can apply to anything. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. You're welcome. I thank you for uh, attending and I hope this was a good use of your time and you can apply it to uh, your business or your BNI team or even your chapter for that matter. If you're a chapter leadership team, apply it to them as well. <laughs>